Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. And not just any video, it's a pixel art tutorial! <laughs> and on top of that, I've actually got a script this time, so I shouldn't fumble my words like I did in my last video. If you're familiar with my old videos, you're probably thinking, haven't you done this twice before already? And I'd say yes, I have. If you're not, and you're tuning into my channel for the first time, hi, I am Zumi, and I do all sorts of creative work for my living. I previously did a tutorial about making custom versus portraits using the existing ones from the official Pokemon games as a base. Though the old videos were kinda sloppily put together and my commentary was less than stellar. So I wanted to do another take on this. For this one, I'll be covering some extra ground as I go. I'll explain some helpful techniques using pixel art in order to help you get a better understanding of things. I will say upfront that this video is aimed at people who have some semblance of understanding about the basic principles of art already. So for example, color usage and proportions, so I won't be covering those in depth. If I did, we'd be here for another few hours, so I'll try to keep things brief, but I'll explain a bit more where applicable. Before we start, if you're serious about learning more about pixel art, I'd recommend getting a book called Pixel Logic. It's a book with over 200 pages worth of information about various pixel art techniques. And no, this isn't a sponsorship, this really is just a really good source of information. It's about 10 bucks, relies almost entirely on visual information rather than text, and uses examples from the past 30 years or so of game pixel art with modern applications, so it makes things really easy to understand. It also comes in a couple of different languages, which is English, French, and Japanese. It's very much worth to read. Even as someone who's been doing sprites for years now, I learn a lot about things I might have not picked up by myself otherwise. I will have a link in the description for those interested. Finally, I do want to point out this is my personal style that I'll be working in for this video, and it might not work the best for you, so I recommend exploring other options if you can. There's plenty of tutorials on YouTube and other social media, so you'll probably find something that works for you eventually. Or if you want to pixel something that's closer to the official Pokemon style, I recommend studying how the portraits are sprited in the games themselves. The Spritus resource is a really good website to find sprites from the official Pokemon games. I'll link it in the description as well. Take notes from what you observe and learn from that. Oh, and that just goes for about any style really, or style studies rather. Studying the thing that you want to replicate is just as important as actually drawing the thing. Having good visual reference really helps, so keep your reference images open next to the canvas you're working in. Anyways, without further ado, let's get spriting. For this tutorial, I'll be using one of my characters, Juno, as the test subject. I will be color picking directly from her artwork in order to get the colors for my sprite work. That being said, if you're struggling with color usage, there are websites and color palette resources you can find all across the internet. But I'll link a couple of my favorites below. Anyways, <laughs> first off, my process when making something from scratch starts out with sketching out what I want to sprite on a bigger scale. This helps us define where we should be putting our pixel line art. Personally, I tend to draw the facial features before anything else as it helps me determine the proportions of the rest of the body. But don't worry about not having all the details in, it'll usually only serve the purpose of defining where everything is positioned. Because guess what? Pixel art is a really forgiving art form when it comes to fixing mistakes later down the line, so don't be scared if stuff doesn't turn out as you want right away. So after I'm done sketching stuff out, I scale back the sketch to be in the same scale as I need the pixel art to be in. A personal method for myself is that I make the background gray, put the sketch layer to a lower opacity, and make a new layer for line art. This is a really good art tip in general, by the way, if you don't make use of it yet. Put your sketch layer on a lower opacity so you never have to experience the grief of drawing your line art on the wrong layer ever again. I'm traumatized. <laughs> While lining is usually the least exciting part about pixel art, it does help having a good foundational technique to doing lines in pixel art. It really likes diagonal lines that consist of the same pixel length, so lines that use 1, 2, or 3 pixels, etc. before doing a step up or down. You want to avoid having jaggies, which are breaks in your line with a shorter or longer step in the same line, like this. I will say, sometimes they're unavoidable, but you can make them look better. We'll cover on how to do so while we're coloring. Another tip for line art is what I like to call the 3, 2, 1, 2, 3 rule, which refers to the amount of pixels you use to draw a curve. It looks something like this. The trick helps you make nice rounded edges. See how it uses 3, 2, and 1 pixel steps? That's where it gets its name from. For sharper rounding around the edges, you'll want to use less steps, and for larger, softer roundings, you'll want to use more steps, like so. But generally speaking, as a base for properly round shapes, which is what I usually see people struggle on, this rule works nicely in a lot of cases. Now that we're done with our line art and we're moving on to the coloring stage, you'll see that stuff is starting to become a little bit more readable. 
The flat colors will help making things easier to distinguish and may show any flaws in your line art or your shape language. So this would be a good first moment to make some adjustments, similar to what I'm doing here. And after fixing some stuff up, I move on to shading. Okay, pause for a moment. Repeat this. See what I'm doing with the mouth here? While giving color to the black lines that I used to draw on the mouth, I interrupted the line art with a slightly lighter color to smoothen the curve. And it looks nicer than the blocky lines when zoomed out, doesn't it? This is a technique in pixel art called anti-aliasing, or AA for short. To put it shortly, this is primarily used to make curves and line art, or transitions between shades of color, seem softer. Maybe you've already heard of the term before because you're familiar with digital art. To explain, most brushes and programs like Clip Studio or Photoshop or Sai have anti-aliasing toggled by default. And what that means is that the pixels around the edge of the brush have lower opacity than the center. So it automatically gives a bit of a softer edge to the brush and makes things look smooth when putting down a line. In contrast to normal digital brushes, pixel brushes use hard edges. There is no variation in opacity, meaning that there is no automatic anti-aliasing going on. However, you do get more precise control by using these pixel brushes, and you can use that precision to simulate anti-aliasing in a more controlled manner. Sometimes it helps make the transition between a lighter and darker color look a little bit less sharp. Or to make shading across the edges of your line art look more natural. To give a simple visual example, if we take a sphere without anti-aliasing, everything looks just a bit too sharp, right? So when we add anti-aliasing into the mix, it'll look like this instead. The shading immediately looks more natural. So now that we know how AA works, we can apply it to the rest of the portrait. Another thing you should pay mind to is differing, which is the use of checker patterns in shading to create transitions between colors. This is something I used in my old sprite work, but nowadays almost never use anymore. This technique is used in a lot of older pixel art, but that was primarily to help with making colors look better on CRT TVs at the time. However, due to better screen fidelity being a thing nowadays, this technique has become somewhat obsolete and may even look ugly if you overuse it on sprites. <coughs> it's fine to use it in a few places if absolutely necessary, but try to avoid it when you can if you're not aiming to have it display on a CRT. Anyways, we're pretty much done with this now. Don't forget that if you're using the sprite in a fan game or whatever, you'll need to scale up the image to two times its size, or it'll show up very tiny in your transition. But other than that, you're good to go. First is portrait done. Okay, pause. Sorry, again. Normally I'd wrap up the tutorial here, but I want to talk about a few traps that I see a lot of beginning sprite artists fall into during the process of coloring and shading sprites. Just so you have that information and don't do it yourself. Since I have a solid foundation thanks to my experience with illustration as a whole, lighting comes pretty natural to me nowadays. However, if you're just starting out, you may not have a good grasp on this yet and end up with pillow shading. To explain pillow shading in simple terms, it's when you don't really have a proper light source and instead shade outwardly from your base colors anywhere. I'm using the sphere again as an example. Here's how it looks when you use pillow shading and here's how it looks when you have a proper light source. And here is a comparison as seen in Juno's hair. See how the person with pillow shading looks odd? There's almost no volume to the hair in comparison to the one with proper directional lighting. I know this is a skill you have to hone over time and might be hard to grasp at first, but the best way to understand how lighting on objects and people works is to imagine what you're drawing as a simplified 3D object, like a cylinder or a cube. And think of how light will reflect off of it when it's coming from specific directions. Heck, you can even try this by grabbing any object on your desk or even using your own hands holding a nearby lamp and seeing what the light hits and what parts have shadow to it. If you use Clip Studio or any 3D software, you could import a 3D object and edit or add any light source to see how it interacts with your object and study it that way. But if you don't have access to this stuff, I'll also link some handy resources in the description that I personally like that you could use. So hopefully once you get a better grasp on how light works and interacts with your subject matter, you'll end up with this instead of this. Oh, and if you can avoid it, don't put highlights at the edge of a shape, because you want to have the place in the middle as it makes the object automatically look more 3D. Of course, this is a different situation if you're doing rim lighting on your sprite, but this is not applicable to what we're doing here today, and it's a whole different can of worms, so we're not gonna bother with explaining that. Just look it up if you're interested. It's a whole different thing about lighting. You won't have to bother with it when you're doing these kind of sprites, normally speaking. Anyways, that's about it for this video. 
If you liked the video and you would like to see more of this kind of stuff, please like, comment, share and subscribe if you want. If you made something using this tutorial, then you can show it to me on social media. You can find me on various sites linked below in the description. You can also support me on Patreon so you can help me out more directly. This video actually was meant to be a Patreon reward for last year. I'm well overdue with posting this, I'm well aware, but I don't want to make a habit out of being late with this kind of stuff and I'm completely serious about making more videos in the future. Getting early access to these videos is one of the perks that you can get from subscribing to my Patreon. So if you're interested in seeing more of my new stuff that I post to YouTube early, then you can choose to do so. I'm still trying to find my way around with what exactly I want to post on YouTube. So if there's a lot of variety in my content, that's just how things are going to be for a little while. I'm trying to find my footing and it just might take a bit. That being said, aside from videos on Patreon, I also post about my game Overgrown, which is something that I've been working on. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can also subscribe for that. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye. Also play Pokemon Rejuvenation.